Hello everyone and welcome to another Atomic Mass Transmission Live. It's a glorious week in November. It is super windy here, so we'll see if our internet holds out. I think it will, because if it would have gone down already, it would have happened by now. I'm so glad you could be here with me today. I'm excited to get uh, into painting. We're going to be painting one of my favorite characters from the Black Order. We're going to be painting Mr. Ebony Ma himself. Uh, if you haven't seen, Mr. BK put up the Black Order and Infinity Gem uh, Rebalance article on the website this morning. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to have some fun and just chat, hang out, do some painting and have a good old time. So I'm going to get this camera off of me. We're going to switch it over to here and we're going to get this show underway. So here is our Ebony Ma ready to go. Hope everyone had a wonderful time over the weekend. I'm excited for everyone to be back with here. We're ready to go. So uh, Simone's favorite, yep, is on the painting table. She loves the Ebony Maws. All right, with that, let's go ahead and just get started. So I'm gonna be using mostly Chimera paints today uh, because I've painted several Ebony Maws. I almost drank my paint water because I was like, oh, coffee, perfect. I'm not gonna do that. Um, uh, but I don't think we've really done a traditionally colored one on stream. Uh, I'm gonna be painting this guy to mostly resemble his comic book iterations probably with my own memory and spin because I don't have a reference going on, but we're gonna be doing mostly blacks, whites, and yellows. Uh, I'm gonna be mixing all of my colors with Chimera. So on my wet palette, I've put out uh, gold yellow, warm yellow, yellow oxide, the phthalo blue with the red shade, violet, black, and white. Uh, if I need something more than that, I will throw it in, but otherwise um, we will go from there. So the first thing I wanna do is I'm just gonna start laying down some black. For this, I'm going to use a purple black because I think that'll be fun. So I'm going to take in the violet and the black and kind of mixing those two together to create, uh, to start anyway, a bit more of a violet than a black. And we're going to build out some colors from there. So I see already we have some questions about the one and only black dwarf and whether he got changes. Uh, the answer is black dwarf did not get any direct changes himself. Uh, but it would be, I think, a mistake to think that he didn't actually get affected in any way uh, by everything else that's gone on around him. So as we were looking at stuff and testing, uh, Black Dwarf has a lot of really powerful abilities and, you know, he's that big old chunky tank. I think he is the easily the most durable four threat in the game. He also has a high offensive hitting power, but he's slow. And one of the things that we noticed uh, similar to like Hulk and some of the other characters that were on bigger bases that had slower mobility. Uh, characters that were able to bully them around the table like Shuri, you know, Kingpin, all of those non-size restricted throws and pushes um, really just exacerbated the issue that Black Dwarf was having in terms of mobility. So with those abilities being certainly curtailed quite a bit and now effectively very few characters smaller than Black Dwarf being able to push him around. Uh, his ability to kind of like tank forward, absorb damage and get into the thick of the action is much increased. The other big change of course uh, is to that Space Gem which unlocks a whole lot of potential uh, for Ebony Ma here to work with his best buddy and really make up for some of that slower movement on Black Dwarf alongside cards like Mothership and stuff because you're going to be able to reposition and move Black Dwarf forward using that. Of course, Thanos can double tap if he takes the Space Gem, so... Uh, the primary deficiency of Black Dwarf being kind of his mobility and his speed, keeping him out of the fight, a lot of those things have been solved around him and in our testing and kind of discussions and looking at it, um, I really felt like the character was in a great spot. It was those other adjustments around him that were really important to kind of get him back in line with the curve to let him do what he wants to do uh, and not make him super oppressive or require a toning down in other areas. Uh, like for example, working on his mobility and speed directly into his kit would have very immediately required probably a toning down uh, in terms of his offensive output, maybe his damage reduction, all of that stuff. So that was 
It's kind of like the inside baseball look at why Black Dwarf remains unchanged on the card, but I think as folks get a chance to start playing with these changes and everything gets released, uh, you're going to see that, yeah, he may still not be the most powerful and uh, potent four threat, but his value is going to go up quite a bit. He's going to get to do what he really excels at a lot more. And his lack of mobility is not going to be as much of a significant and noticeable hindrance as it has been in the past. Especially with a little bit of like thoughtful play and everything else. Okay, I think I'm going to come in, I'm going to do this. Just black. I'm just going to lay down some of that violet. Uh, Da, 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 da. So Black Dwarf is, as far as like the intended play style, is that he's very much a bit of a slow-moving tank. Like no one can absorb damage quite like Black Dwarf can between just his innate stamina values, his ability to discount one damage from his thick hide invulnerable hide, whatever that hide ability is called. And then once he gets there, I mean, he's swinging at, he's in that rare crew of folks in the Thor threat, they're swinging like they have five threat attack values. So he's got the throw, he has the intimidating presence, which that might not be the exact name of the role, but basically the bodyguard up close. So once he gets there, your opponent really has to deal with him. Um, and that's kind of like his intended play style is this very aggressive, he was our before Luke Cage even, Luke Cage, um, that kind of idea of having this character that bodyguards from up close by being in the opponent's face rather than standing in the back like a Koye and, you know, actively protecting you. It's the threat of that person being up close that actually makes the difference. He was the first one who kind of fell into that, so. Uh, da, 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 da. No, so I did a Zenith Prime, so this isn't the raw plastic. This has been airbrush primed with a dark gray, and then I went over that from a 45 degree angle with the airbrush with a light gray. So it kind of looks on camera like maybe it's been unprimed, but it's definitely been primed. Um, I think I'm going to just do a little white violet wash over the face too just to give us some undertoning for moving forward. Uh, da, da. Somebody I think was asking about, uh, somebody was asking about Ma's changes and specifically his builder. Um, so we kept the builder at a flat one power Primarily because between his ability to just generate three power a turn natively um, and the changes to his kit, especially to how his defenses work, so he no longer has to spend power to activate his ability to use his psychic defense. Instead, he's now playing that more of a disruption role uh, as he was always intended to by forcing your opponent to spend two power if they don't want to go up against a six psychic threat or defense. Um, that that really took him into a place where putting a straight builder allowed him to do just everything he ever wanted to do with no, there was no real consideration at that point. I was like, well, I'll attack you with this amazing mystic attack. I'll move you, so I'm probably going to strip you of an action because you're going to have to move back since I get to advance you short with my, my builder. I'll gain all this power. Then maybe I'll throw something at you. Maybe I'll use my spender. Like, there was just too much. There's too much that he could do too reliably, even for a five threat, if he was generating that kind of that kind of power on every builder attack. So by keeping it a flat one, he still has access to all of his toolkit pretty easily, especially if he double attacks between the three flat power generation. But you still have to make some choices, and I think that's part. You know, we talk a lot about what makes games fun 
and what we're always looking for in game design is player choice, the ability to kind of flex your decision making and your, uh, your strategies and adapt to an ever unfolding situation that you don't have perfect info to and, you know, to maybe make perfect choices and have everything work out because the dice love you and your opponent plays right into your hands or maybe everything goes pear-shaped. The dice don't love you, your opponent anticipates or does something unexpected, and now you kind of have to like think your way out of that box. Um, so those are all very much reasons as to why we were watching uh, the builder. And we did try it with, we tried it like very shortly with him Gaining power equal to the damage dealt, but keeping the attack value at a five, and we didn't like it very much. Um, we wanted to increase his damage potential, because I think one of the things that we talked about in the article, um, but it's always worth keeping in mind, is that you know the Black Order affiliation was really the very first affiliation that was more about heavy attrition play and KOing and dazing characters and all this stuff. And while Black Dwarf was designed to be you know, the character that broke that mold a little bit, he certainly is the most controlly character of the bunch. Um, as we were testing and looking at this new rebalance, we really wanted to amp up uh, his ability to also play with, play with the other Black Order characters and deal more damage and be that kind of damagey character in addition to everything else he was doing, so. Giving him that strength six, even though he only generates one power off of it, makes him a very potent damage dealer as well against non-mystic characters specifically. Um, and so that helped kind of like fit him better into the Black Order's play style and where things want to go. And I guess because everyone's here, and it didn't get mentioned in the article, um, you know, the Black Order still has some characters that we haven't explored yet in the game. Uh, but there's always an eye to those characters showing up. And some of the rebalance changes also factored in those plans as well. So this isn't the end of everything that players are going to see and all that stuff. Uh, -da -da -da. I mean, I think you're going to have a lot more trouble pushing and throwing Black Dwarf these days than you would have in the past, but that is absolutely uh, one of the mitigating counterplay tactics that you can use for Dwarf. However, if you kit out you know, a Space Stone for him to add the extra movement, if you take him with Thanos, which also grants you the Cosmic Portaling, if you have Mothership, there's a lot of ways for that Black Dwarf to get into you and, uh, and cause a lot of concern, but yes, he's like I mentioned, he's not meant to be at the top tier of four threats. So, and honestly, making him compete with a Corvus Glaive, you know, they have to do different things. Whether that is currently super valuable to your play style and the way in which you want to, you know, run Black Order, mileage will vary. I think, again, as people start to see how so many of these other changes to characters dramatically infect and impact your size as a character being so important to your displacement, uh, you'll find that he's a lot harder to move. Uh, as far as like second leaderships and stuff, we always have discussions and there's always room for, you know, growth and expansion. I don't think any affiliation, if you've read any of our interviews that we've done recently on several places, this question gets asked a bit. But nothing that we've done uh, is considered done, right? The Marvel Universe is so big and expansive 
and there's so many different versions of so many of the characters that what we try to do from a development perspective is we test everything to be great within itself. So we know for sure these characters are coming, they're going to form the core of Black Order. We kind of have to test based on the assumption that if they never get anything else, they're still going to feel, you know, viable and complete and fun and people enjoy them and that's perfectly great. Um, but we also have to always keep in mind that there is room for expansion. We're going to go places and there are going to be ideas that we can't fully explore at the time that we'll come back to later. And new leaderships and stuff like that are definitely part of it. Um, so I don't think that it's, in, it's crazy or unreasonable to expect that Black Order will someday get a secondary leadership or a third or a fourth, who knows. Um, there are absolutely, I think, good reasons to believe that, you know, another version of Corvus, another version of Proxima, another version of Maul, there are characters we haven't even explored yet. Black Swan, Supergiant being two very clear members of the Black Order that we haven't seen in the game yet. All those things open up a lot of possibilities and opportunity. So, uh, do, 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 do. I don't think the Space Stone's the only justification. There are definitely characters that can teleport Black Dwarf around as well. You know, Red Skull with his Cosmic Cube shenanigans, definitely being one of them. New Strange with his Scalpel of Strange, Lockjaw. I think it's somewhat dependent on what other characters and what your strategies are and what do you want that character to do. And honestly, short move on a 65 mil base is not that insanely slow either. He's going to cover a decent amount of distance. Is it going to be enough? Well, I don't know. That's based on game plan and which crises you're taking and what the rest of your characters are aiming to do. Again, there's a ton of choices that you as a player are making to determine what is valuable to you, what is useful to you, and are you getting the maximum out of the characters that you're taking? I think it's, you know, a disservice to yourself though to not try different things and explore different tactics and options because there are so many that you can take. If that, I mean, if you look at a character and you're like, this just doesn't fit what I want or my play style or anything like that, oh, that's completely fine. But I don't think that one tactical analysis necessarily says that that character doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So, yes, in Black Order, I think... You know, if you want more mobility out of Black Dwarf, you got Space Stone, you got Thanos, you have Mothership. If you want to splash him into other affiliations, there are options there. And I think he's a great criminal syndicate pick. I agree with some of the folks who are saying that in chat. Like, Black Dwarf stays healthy for a long, long time, and criminal syndicate loves characters that stay healthy for a long, long time. Are there other threat fours you'd rather take? Well, I don't know what your game plan is, you know? But I've certainly seen him be quite monstrous and successful in criminal syndicate lists that I've run in testing and other things. I've had him have good use in Cabal. We've seen playtesters do some pretty cool stuff with him outside of affiliation. Is he the most efficient choice? Again, I don't know. Maybe not. But... That's, that's a pretty loaded question, if you ask me, just because of all the variables and the things that you have to consider. Maybe it's cut and dry. I don't know. But end of the day, being size 4 in this game, or size 5, one of the big things about the rebounds in general is to make sure that 
the bigger, beefier, meatier characters gain benefit from you know their size and their ability to dominate and kind of bully the battlefield a little bit in that way. And I, you know, personal opinion time because that's what all of this really is. I think overall with the whole suite of changes, we really, it, it turned out the way we were hoping and we've accomplished something pretty cool uh, in terms of making that be more impactful. Now it's not oppressive, but I don't think anybody wants a tactic or a strategy to be oppressive. We just want it to be viable. And there's counterplay and workarounds to everything. That's what makes the game fun and interesting. Oh, everything's blowing up. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many articles we have left. As we talked about in previous streams, there's definitely going to be some things that are left as surprises. Quote, unquote, surprises. Um, by the time everything drops. So, I guess that's another little juicy spoiler for people to get prepared for. Okoye does definitely have changes. Um, as I think most people expect that she will. She got a little bit of rebalances too. Yeah, nine times out of 10, I think. Everyone in the community has been pretty good about selecting the characters that are going to see a look. I like to think that maybe we surprised folks a couple of times with what that look meant, but Okoye definitely has a couple changes. that I don't believe are covered in an article, but will be uh, shown in full force when the rebalance cards hit the website and all of it goes live. For realsy, realsy. Right, knocking in this. Uh, the new cards are identical in size to the current cards. They're four by six. They just happen to be horizontal instead of vertical aligned. So you can absolutely use your existing sleeves and if you want to back the print and play cards, if you wanted to have a little more sturdy support in those sleeves with the existing cards for the characters, that'll work out great. get really quiet here because I'm working around the fact that I can't move this guy the way I want to. Challenges of the stream painting, getting stuck on this stand to make sure I stay on camera. If anybody's wondering, this yellow base that I'm kind of laying down to start is just a mix of yellow oxide and warm yellow from those Chimera paints that I'm working with. I can't really give you an exact ratio because I'm just mixing them on the wet palette till I think I like it, but I was just looking for something a little more on the ochre side because I knew that would cover better before I start building up my highlights. So. Uh, Yeah, for the chat that's asking, I think that the changes to displacement in general from other characters like Shuri, Black Panther, and others uh, absolutely have a huge impact in terms of Black Dwarf's game plan and how effective he is at doing what he wants to do because, you know, again, while he's slightly slower than some characters, the biggest, I think, issue, or one of the biggest issues to his standing around powers 
was the fact that there were just too many size restrictionless pushes and throws and things like that. And even though the final full list of stuff isn't out there yet, I think at this point it's very clear that our design intention going forward is having a size restrictionless push or throw is something that's very rare and very unique to the character. And otherwise, size three has kind of become the norm for just about everyone who's not a Hulk or a huge big boy who can mess around with it. Okay, we're gonna go back to those pants. And the shoes, I'm just gonna quickly knock over some black over the shoes just to tone down my blue. So I got violet undertones on my black pants and more of the blue undertones on the shoes. I'm gonna work with that. I'm just being sloppy right now. I'm gonna let the paint kind of do what it wants and then I'll go back through and with my highlights, I will see what I got and mess with it. Uh, -da -ba -da. <laughs> plan for Thursday stream. I don't actually know. Uh, wait, yeah, I do know what the plan for Thursday stream is. It's going to be an MCP game. It's going to feature. One Dallas Kemp and one Will Pagani. So I'm, they're going to be throwing Convocation on the table and uh, I think Dark Dimension is the current plan. Unless something changes. So it should be a really good throwdown. Drag out fight from those two. They get a rematch from the last time they took the core box on the table. Mix a little bit of that. Cold yellow and warm yellow. Make a bit of a highlight color here. that in. What else we got going on? Uh, I don't know what the characters are going to be used specifically, so. I just know it'll be convocation. Maybe magic will make an appearance. I don't know. The players will figure out their lists. And I don't know who's playing what. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that Dallas is going to play Dark Dimension. But they might also have to, you know, Rochambeau for that privilege because I know both of them are very much into the big bad guy style of play. So we will see. Uh, oh, Dallas loves Dormammu. Uh, to be honest, both Dallas and Pagani, their their primary choices are typically typically the big bads. So Thanos, Dormammu, those characters are right up there, right up there, desired like set. We'll stop at that yellow. I have no doubt uh, if they were left to their own devices, we'd probably wind up seeing a Thanos fully gemmed up 
SmackDown versus Dormammu in his dark dimension just to see who was the true cosmic threat. But the current schedule says Convocation versus Dormammu. So, unless somebody pulls a fast one on poor Mr. Big K, that is what we will see on Thursday. continue to mess with this yellow but I think I'm just gonna leave it for a little bit move on to something else this will take a few more coats and some glazing to get to where I want it I think but overall we're not looking too bad Yeah, it could be. I mean, Thanos is Thanos is certainly uh, a worthy opponent for Dormammu when it comes to the Marvel Crisis Protocol story. Especially once you get to equip him with a couple of those choice Infinity Gems. Mix up. I'm just mixing more white into the shade color that I made with my phthalo blue and my black and my white. This might be a little too white, but we'll play it by ear. Well, I'll play it by ear and blend it out. <laughs> Dark Order. No affiliations are changing at the moment. So, uh, you know, their current roster list for Black Order is the same as it was. You know, it, we always talk about how affiliations and stuff are very much drawn from their comic inspirations and roots, but we obviously have to kind of curate and choose membership and stuff based on other criteria as well. And uh, with Nebula and Gamora specifically, they were never officially part of the Black Order. They were daughters of Thanos, but they weren't they weren't where we felt like they should be in order to include them in affiliation. And of course the affiliation was also very much tested and balanced around them not being included. So maybe there will be a future version of those characters that winds up joining the ranks or who knows what the future has, but at least for right now. The Black Order group is still very much set to what it is currently. Uh, Let the dust settle from the current rebalance for a little bit, I think. And of course, I also believe that you know the core obviously will get the new the new characters, the rebalance characters. We'll get the new core rules, of course, which will adjust some of the you know, Infinity Gem rules and. All of the turn zero stuff that we've talked about a few times, and Pagani wrote that great article on a couple weeks ago. Uh, but we're also, you should be seeing an updated banned and restricted list as well. 
we can take into account some of the adjustments that we've been looking at. So there will be there's definitely no shortage of exciting times going into the holidays, the holiday month of December. Give people plenty of time to maybe play some games and reclimate to some new strategies and tactics and everything else. And then if you're in the U.S., glorious news. Several of the delayed releases, including those convocation members, Dormammu, all that good stuff, are finally getting release dates. I've gotten seen some reports of several stores across the U.S. already having them. Ready to go on sale. I think Blade and Moon Knight are arriving at stores in preparation for their release this Friday. Okay, you can correct me if my dates are wrong on that. But uh, we do have friends and contacts within the studio who know folks who run gaming stores and things like that. So the reports I was hearing today was that signs were good, they were showing up, people had them, people were very excited. I'm excited for everybody to get them. We're very excited for folks to be able to post what they're doing on Instagram using hashtag painting protocol. Looking forward to seeing all those crazy Dormammu blade paint jobs and conversions and Everybody adding that stuff in. Yeah, both be Friday. See, nailed it. So, like I said, we've definitely talked to several folks that we know who own game stores who've said that they've showed up. So they have them ready to go for release. Hallelujah. Finally happening. Couldn't be more excited. And then next month should see all the convocation stuff releasing as well. So, end of the year, I think everything that was delayed should be caught up for crisis protocol, barring some other unforeseen logistical U.S. shipping thing, because the Lord knows it's different every day. There's a lot of uncertainty. And just a lot of challenges that we're facing right now. So, oh my gosh. Womp womp. Just went super sloppy on that. Don't even say what! Uh, what rules change? Am I most excited? Well, first, I will not take, uh, I will not take lead dev I won't take that title. That is, so I am, I'm the lead designer, um, which is probably the easier of the jobs because I just come up a lot of the times with the crazy ideas and kind of maintain the vision. It's uh, Will Pagani and then our new developer, Sarah Rowan. Um, it's their job to take all of the maniacal ravings and the cool ideas and turn them into playable rules and all of that good stuff. So... Um, they are my 100% partners in crime. And then our other devs, Michael Plummer, Andrew Dursum, and then also folks like Josh and Dallas have a huge impact in just in terms of testing and talking about changes and everything else. So it's a, it's a whole team effort, um, but absolutely not possible without the amazing brain power of our fantastic developers who crunch the numbers and do the math and run the testing and all of that stuff. That said, I think, you know, there's not one change specifically that I'm super excited about because I think as we've talked about a little bit with regards to, you know, like why didn't Black Dwarf get changed? He has all these deficiencies right now. Um, 
there's so there's so much that's going to happen in the aggregate you know each change in many ways a lot of these changes build on each other they have wider impacts than just being to the characters that they affect um, and that's true both the you know the nerfs quote unquote the toning down as well as the toning up and i think that's really exciting and that's been my most enjoyed that's been the most enjoyable part of this whole process and everything is just seeing how you know we always we talk about a lot how games like crisis protocol or all the other fantastic games we get to work on they're living ecosystems right they you introduce something to them a new rule or just a new character a new squad a new whatever and everything in that ecosystem kind of adjusts around it it has repercussions and one of the things that the game devs and you know myself and everyone else in the studio who works on testing and looking at this stuff have to always keep in mind is okay you can do this but then what does it mean for everything else and a lot of these rebalances are us learning the natural state of the ecosystem better and what those repercussions and impacts can be when you do certain things you know what happens when you don't take into account the fact that you need to be aware you can't just have a bunch of characters running around without restrictions on their pushes and their throws um, because it negatively impacts character design choices in, uh, in unforeseen well or at the time unforeseen ways like your black dwarf um, so adjusting in those cases suddenly changes not just the overall levels of those characters but also is a great boon and buff to the characters that are getting pushed around or negatively impacted by that unhealthy state of the game um, so you know I'm, I'm really excited for people to finally get the whole picture and to start playing with it and to you know learn new strategies and tactics to be able to unlock certain characters that might have struggled in comparison either because of their efficiencies or the over efficiencies of other characters um, to see all that stuff come together in one big kind of overarching change and then you'll discover a new state of the game because things will change old tactics may not be as viable and hopefully if we've you know if we've identified stuff and and done it appropriately we don't want nobody really wants those tactics to be viable because you know they were either unintended consequences or oversights or whatever or they just needed to be tuned down they were just too efficient for their cost their opportunity cost their point cost whatever that doesn't mean that they were bad and it doesn't mean that the players who utilized them necessarily were doing anything wrong they were just playing the game as it was presented but just because there wasn't anything intrinsically like morally wrong with it doesn't also doesn't mean that it was right you know um, I think people oftentimes get caught up in like value judgments to morality judgments to like personal judgments and it's everything in the game was there using it you know is not inherently bad unless you did it maliciously you know I I'm not going to excuse you if you're like well if I do this and this I know it breaks everything and I'm just going to go out and I'm going to ruin everybody's good time because end of the day as I always talk about what makes these games so special and so enjoyable is the fact that you play them with other people it's only a way to like maliciously play a game wrong is to go out and say well I'm going to have fun at the expense of other people you know and that doesn't mean that you like it's very different and it's so nuanced no one's gonna like I'm gonna get in trouble trying to elucidate this idea in the short time we have here over the internet but if you go out and you say I'm gonna do my best and I'm gonna win and I'm gonna take all the efficient things because that's what I want to do I want 
I want to exercise my skills at building the best list and running it to peak efficiency. That's fine. If you say, oh, look at this combination of two things. If you do this, it has an unintended found consequence and my opponent will never be able to do anything they ever want and won't that be fun for me? Um, I'm sorry, but yeah, that's now I think we can start talking about that just being a poor life choice, <laughs> you know? Um, but that's part of our job as developers is to, you know, guard and watch for that to make sure that those intended unintended consequences are caught and in robust and living games like this, we don't always we don't always get it right 100% of the time, but that's why you can't be afraid to go in there with your gardening tools and do a little bit of gardening work. Uh, and it's the best for everyone as a whole. Uh, da -da. So, yeah, it's, look, there's always going to be a place for strategies that, you know, work against opponents. Characters like MODOK are good and healthy for the game, but they need to have counterplay. And sometimes when they can just do their thing a little too efficiently over everything else, that's a problem. Um, but, you know, I don't think anyone who is playing MODOK and utilizing that efficiency or playing Valkyrie and using those efficiencies was going in there with the intent to make their opponent have a bad time, you know. And that's a very, that's a conscious choice. There's the, I'm going to play this game the way that I would play it, which is to play the efficiencies to win my games as, as well and as strongly as possible, and I'm going to use these things to do it. And that's fine. But to go in there and say, I'm going to actively make sure that my opponent has a terrible time, or you know, rejoice in the fact that your opponent is getting frustrated and not having fun because of what you're doing, that's a little different. And I've certainly met players who fit that bill, and I've met players who their point wasn't to make you not have a good time, but they just happened to build a list that did. Those players are typically always willing to talk with you, like, how, how could you do better next time? Yeah, you got caught by this. You should think about this next time, you know? It's about skill improvement on both sides of the field. I don't know about you, but I always think it's more interesting when my opponents grow with me. So the challenge is always there, and gotchas are not typically how I want to win a game. More than once, maybe. But, teach their own. Um, the game will be different. There will be new strategies and stuff that will come out of it. There will be other strategies that will be, you know, perfectly viable from the olden days. They'll just be a little less efficient, and that's good. And kind of the point. And the game will continue to grow and expand and, you know, go in all these cool directions that we look forward to. Uh, and, yeah. So that's my answer. There's not one change. It's, it's all the changes, and it's all the changes being out there at once in the wild and players getting the chance to, you know, look at all that, adapt to it, grow, and watch what they come up with. Because I think it's so cool to watch players learn and adapt and, cle and be clever. And it was the thing that I loved when I, when I was a teacher. You know, the joy of teaching is watching understanding and knowledge flow into your student to watch as a group becomes more knowledgeable and more understanding of like what's going on and why and all of this stuff. So it's the same thing here. You know, we're going to get to watch people be creative and smart and exercise their muscles and surprise us and improve their skills and get better and better. And that's going to be really cool. And I think, you know, we're going to be doing it in a very in a much healthier ecosystem that takes the lessons that we learned along the way and makes the game more fun and enjoyable for all types of players. Oop. 
Uh, walk into a game. Are we still on track for mid this week? Uh, I don't. I don't think it's mid this week. Um, I believe that we are still on track currently for before American Thanksgiving. So that that's my current that's my current uh, understanding of where we are in terms of the things being posted and everything. So one more week maybe to go. before everything happens. Uh, Given him his unhealthy complexion, he's trying, trying a lot of mixtures here, seeing how things go. I don't have my metallic, so I'm not going to be able to do like his gold bracers and stuff, but I'll get to those later. What do we got going on? Uh, yeah, if anybody's asking about the Corvus energy defense thing, that was just a, an error that wasn't on the print file, but was caught in proofing and apparently didn't make it to the article. So Corvus's defenses haven't changed. He's threes across the board still. Uh, but a lot of the times when we're proofing things in final form, BK is also working on getting marketing assets and stuff done because they all have to get kind of approved on the same line. So sometimes if a mistake or an error slips through the initial graphic design layout, which is why you proof, um, it doesn't always 100% of the time get caught until the marketing thing goes, and unfortunately, um, people can grab like the file they think is correct, but it's not the right file because the right file got moved. There's, it's a whole dance, and we try to be as uh, good about it as possible, but we don't always catch everything. So, But the final file is correct, and it is threes across the board. Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this month is still on track. Not this week. You scared me with the week thing. I was like, I don't remember saying this week. Um, I mean, I, I remember hoping for this week, but I definitely don't remember saying this week. I could try to give ourselves... Oh, see, this is the, this is the hard one. I'm not going to be able to come in at the eyes the way I want to. Uh. I wish I could paint with my left hand when this happens. Stupid thing. <laughs> what else we got going on? <laughs> no worries. I think for the, the debate that's raging right now, like, yeah, there's always going to be folks who walk into something in any game that they're not prepared for, and they might walk away feeling not great. I think it comes down to, you know, what mitigating factors are there for a player to come back? And there's a skill, there's definitely a skill ceiling that applies to that. You want players to be able to grow and improve and get better at a game. You want to see them become more adept and to discover new techniques and strategies because I think that skill development, just like we talk about when it comes to painting miniatures and stuff, is so important. But you also need to do your best to make sure that your skill floor is low enough 
that when players come in for the first time, they don't immediately get disabused from wanting to come back and get better. There has to be some level of success. And we talk about this a lot. You know, Dallas is really great about talking about it when it comes to the hobby side. Just putting paint on a miniature for the first time is a huge success because a lot of people are very, very scared of the hobby. And rightfully so. You know, people don't consider themselves an artist. They don't, they don't know anything about how to apply paint to a miniature. The biggest hurdle to overcome is to just do it the first time and to see success. I can't imagine, you know, a situation where if that ceiling, if that floor is too high and somebody can't see success in a way that is enjoyable and meaningful, and this doesn't mean winning a game, right? I think you can't equate success to winning, but it, success can be seeing something cool happen, feeling like you made or you had decision-making powers that would have led you to victory if you had done things slightly different. Still getting to use your cool abilities and, and toys, quote-unquote. You know, good games allow that to happen even if you have no experience with the game. And skill absolutely matters to your chances of success and the way in which you come out of it. Because the ceiling can still be as high as you want. And if you play people who are at different levels between the floor and the ceiling, you're going to see it matter. But skill can't be the only deterministic factor. It shouldn't be. At least not as far as, you know, our design philosophy and everything goes. So it is a delicate balance that always has to be considered. But overall, you'll find that our design philosophy rewards clever strategy, but clever strategy is not the end-all be-all of the experience. Actually playing the game well adapting to elements of chance and luck and everything else will also matter a lot to success. And those random elements, those unplannable things, are what allow for a lower skill floor. Because there are things outside of a player's control that stop them from being able to just completely overtake and railroad an opponent of a very lower skill level. Yeah, you know, some people appreciate that kind of experience and some people don't. But that's something that you always have to consider is how high is your skill floor? Because the floor is where everyone starts. And if you want your game community to continually have new players and to see growth and to be successful and thrive, that balance is super important. Because just like you don't want a game to be figured out and quote unquote solved too quickly because then you stop progressing, and you stop getting that dopamine hit of improving your skills. You also don't want that floor to be so high that only the most dedicated of dedicated people ever stick with it. And you know, that determination is gonna be different for every person. If you asked 100 people, where's the right floor, where's the right ceiling? Everyone's gonna give you a different answer, especially when it comes to the floor. Oh, that's weird. Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. Yeah, di I mean, unintended things happening. Um, whoa, sorry, one second. When you rinse your brush, you go all the way. Yes, I absolutely. I just dunk the whole brush in. And then what you want to do is re repoint the tip either by rolling it over a paper towel or I just, 
I just clean it with my mouth. Um, as people have seen me do it before, be going on. Uh, but yeah, comeback mechanics are really important because you always want players to feel like they have a chance um, or at least have a chance to do something cool. You know, you don't always have to have a way to win, but you want players to feel like they have control over doing something neat and unexpected or something thematic and cool. Uh, you'll notice a lot of the times when we play games, half the time myself or Josh or Dallas uh, run into the game with this like, I don't care if I win or lose, but I'm going to do X, Y, or Z. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to achieve this tactic card. I'm going to blow up that guy. I've determined that if I take down this target, I have successfully won my game. Those, those kinds of things are important. And variance in dice and unexpected consequences, figuring your way out of those, are like super, super important. And making an enjoyable game and to giving players that moment of success that they need to really enjoy the game. Making a clever play. Even if that clever play doesn't stop you from losing, the fact that you did something smart and you were given that opportunity to do it can be huge. Uh, da, 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 da. I need to do his buttons. Foolish. I need to do his buttons black, I think. Just because it'll be quick. I'm not even looking at the clock. I probably should. Oh my gosh, it's 2.02. I'm not done. I am not done. But I suppose I probably need to be done. So I guess we'll save the buttons for later along with the gold. But overall, I'm pretty happy with where we got to in our hour along with our talking. So yeah, we'll just finish up the buttons, do a little bit of cleanup and stuff on the whites. Um, definitely need to go over the hair a little bit more and then we'll do these bracers in gold and I'll call this guy effectively completed. Uh, pretty fun. Decided to do. Uh, with that, I'm going to move this camera off of this and put it on me so I can say goodbye to y'all. So thanks so much for hanging out with me over this hour. I uh, hope that you had fun. Hope maybe you learned something or at least had some fun discussions in the chat. It looked like it was going crazy in there. I always love having this chance to hang out with you. Join us back tomorrow, 1 p.m. Pacific. It's going to be Michael Plummer and myself. We're going to be painting up some more Star Wars Legion for our armies there. Uh, talking about all the Star Wars stuff and everything. And then on Thursday, Will Pagani, Dallas Camp, throwing it down, MCP style. Dormammu versus Convocation should be a great one. Uh, so be sure to turn in for that. Until next time, friends, stay beautiful, be good to each other, and I will see you on the next one. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>